Well, this morning we uh, come to the end of Mark's gospel, as I mentioned earlier, and I'd like to begin by reading uh, our, our passage, which this morning is verses 15 through 20 of Mark chapter 16. And again, you can either follow along on the screen or turn to it in your Bibles. Um, one thing you may notice in your Bibles is that verse 14 is included in this paragraph, and I actually included it in last week's sermon. I'm going to begin reading in verse 15, but just to remind you that what happens in verse 14 is actually in a different location than what's happening in verse 15. Uh, verse 14 happens in Jerusalem. Verse 15, where we're reading, happens at one of the mountains that Jesus designated in the land of Galilee in which he would show himself to his apostles uh, final time uh, before ascending into heaven. Let me go ahead and read that uh, text for you. Mark 16, beginning in verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. And then, I, I'm not sure if the rest of this text is here on the screen, but there is one last uh, uh, parenthetical verse here. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. By the way, you'll probably notice that that, that section there really didn't fit with what went on before because Peter was there when Jesus gave the instructions. This doesn't follow from the end of verse 20. It actually follows from the end of verse 8. But we're going to get uh, into that in, uh, in just a few moments. Anyway, may the Lord bless again this part of his word to our hearing this morning. Now, last time, as you recall, we were looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the importance of the resurrection uh, to our Lord himself, because remember, this was his father's vindication. Uh, it was basically the father's um, witness or testimony uh, that Jesus was, in fact, who he claimed to be and that he actually had done what he set out to do, what he said he would do. Uh, the resurrection from the dead is a pretty powerful testimony to that fact. We also saw that it was Jesus' justification, again from the Father, that the sins that he had carried on the cross, remember they weren't his sins, but our sins if we've trusted in Jesus, and the sins of everyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it was his justification that those sins had been paid for. And so now he is freed from the dead. You know, the wages of sin is death. And if those sins had not been removed, those sins would have kept Jesus in the grave. But the fact that he paid for them means that, you know, they've been discharged. The fact that he was raised from the dead means that the Father has accepted his payment. And that, of course, means that there is forgiveness. And that's why the resurrection is important for us. Because if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, as we saw last week, then neither would we. Paul tells us that if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, then those who had fallen asleep in Jesus, those who had died, would have perished. And when we would die, we also would perish. We would basically go to hell with the rest of mankind who didn't trust in Jesus Christ to begin with. The resurrection is important because it is our deliverance from death, from hell, from the grave. Without the resurrection, Paul said, we would be of all men most miserable. But finally, we also saw why it was important that the disciples, and we, of course, as well, believe that the resurrection actually took place. Why it was important for Jesus to appear to them. 
that they wouldn't, you know, that they didn't continue grieving and mourning over the fact that their, their Lord and their Savior had been crucified and he was in the grave, why it was important that they continue uh, not to, to really not believe, I can put it that way, the testimony that uh, Mary and the women brought to them and also the two on the road to Emmaus told them. And that reason was that they were to be witnesses of the resurrection. Now, to be a witness, you have to see what it is that you're going to testify of, what you're going to bear witness to. And if you're going to be a good witness, a convincing witness, you have to believe strongly enough that what you're saying is true. I mean, how are you going to convince people? that Jesus rose from the dead, if you're not convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus showed himself to them that they might go and tell others that which they saw and were firmly convinced of. And by the way, as I mentioned before, we need to do the same. Now, we haven't seen the risen Lord, but we do know that Jesus Christ has been raised through eyewitness testimony and through the work that he has done in our hearts. He has changed our lives. Jesus is going to point to a very important evidence as to how people will know that we are his disciples. And again, it's not going to be tied up just in these signs, but in something that is far more powerful than these. Now, we see the necessity of their believing in the resurrection even more strongly in our text this morning as Jesus now calls them to take this gospel and proclaim it in all creation. I mean, what the gospel means, good news. And if, if the good news isn't good news for you, if you're not convinced it's good news, you're not going to be able to share it as good news to others. So again, they needed to believe in the resurrection. They needed to know that they served a risen, a risen Lord before Jesus gave them this commission. But now we see this commission now that they're convinced. And I really want us to see two things this morning, of course. That is the commission that he gives to his disciples which is to preach the gospel to all creation. And then I want us to look at the signs or the evidences that Jesus said would follow those who actually believed. So first of all, after Jesus showed himself to his disciples in Jerusalem, we read as we compare Matthew's gospel with Mark's that he actually appeared to them again at one of the mountains in Galilee. And there he gave them a mission. He gave them a task They were to take his gospel, which is the message of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done, of his obedience to his Father's commandments, of his death on the cross, of his teaching that he had entrusted to them, and they were to take it to the entire world, go and preach the gospel to every living creature. Now, here's something we need to be thankful for, because Jesus did not say, just go to the Jews, but go also to the Gentiles. Now, you know from Scripture that on numerous occasions we we read that Jesus sent his apostles to preach to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And we, we may ask, well, why to the Jews first? Well, it's because, of course, this gospel was the fulfillment of all of God's promises to them. And so they had to hear it first because God promised it to them first. But after they heard it and either accepted or rejected it, then they were to go to the Gentiles and preach it to them so that they too might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. They might too have eternal life. And this, of course, was in fulfillment to the promise that was actually made to Abraham that through his seed, all the kingdoms, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Again, we need to be very thankful for that because, uh, as I mentioned before, I don't think any of us here are natural children of Abraham. And actually, in this present age, it might be to our advantage because so many Jews today do not believe in their Messiah. So the Lord has been pleased to reveal his his, uh, son to the Gentiles, to those who were not his people, in order that we might have life, but also in order that he might provoke them to believe. Now, Jesus did say that those who believed would be saved. And again, we understand by that, not just that they believe that testimony, that they believe these things just took place, that they actually happened, but that those who believe these things, 
might actually put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the word that is translated in our Bibles, faith, in the Greek language, is actually an active word. It's a word that uh, means to act on what one believes. Uh, to the Jewish mind, and again, this is given in a Jewish context, if you say you believe something, but you don't act on that belief, then you really don't believe it to begin with. It's, it's something that, um, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, what do you think? If, if I said there was a bomb in this pulpit, would you believe me if I stood here and uh, you know, continued to preach even though there's a bomb here? Uh, no, you wouldn't believe it because I didn't act on it. I didn't do something about it. If I really believed there was a bomb here, I would try to get the bomb out of the building or to try to get us out of the building. Well, the same thing is true with regard to the gospel. One might believe it's true, but you really don't believe it in a saving sense unless you act on it. You have to actually trust this one who is offered to you as a savior. So Jesus is saying that if you really believe the gospel is true or those who really believe it will turn from their sins and they will trust in him as the gospel actually requires. And if you do that, Jesus says, you will be saved. But now what if they don't believe? Well, Jesus says in verse 16, he who has disbelieved will be condemned. Now we might think that that's a bit harsh, but we know from Scripture that it really isn't. Because a person who is, is condemned not merely for rejecting Jesus Christ, although we do believe it's a very serious sin to reject the gospel. Uh, Jesus did say on one occasion that it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment. Those uh, people of, the, of those cities were extremely wicked, as we know. It would be more tolerable for them than for Capernaum. And yet Capernaum wasn't guilty of having committed such sins as they committed in Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet they were guilty of a greater sin. They heard the gospel. They heard Jesus teaching and preaching in their streets. They saw his miracles, and they still did not believe. Jesus said it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah because they committed those sins in darkness than for Capernaum, who heard the gospel and rejected it. It's a very serious sin to reject the gospel. But that's only one of many reasons why any will be condemned. The reason why they will is because they're rejecting the only way that God has given that man might be saved, that he might be forgiven. And if you reject the only way of forgiveness, then you're going to have to stand trial before God for all of your sins. So they're not being condemned merely for rejecting the gospel. They're being condemned for all the sins that they're committing, which is, again, why it's, it's a very dangerous situation to be in if you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ because at every moment you're in danger of judgment for your sins. You need to run to safety in the Lord Jesus Christ by turning from your sins and trusting him. Now, Jesus goes on to say that those who believe were also to be baptized and as we saw last Lord's Day evening, that Jesus is not saying here that baptism is a part of the equation of salvation or that formula by which a person might be saved. It's only the outward symbol of what actually does save you. And the Bible tells us plainly that Jesus alone is the one who saves. That it's by trusting in Jesus Christ alone that we are saved. And that by trusting in Jesus Christ, it basically the Spirit of God is is baptized us into the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual immersion that the Spirit of God performs when he actually puts you in Jesus Christ, when he connects you to Jesus Christ. I mean, we're born outside of Christ. We have to be in Christ if we are to be saved. The Spirit of God is the one who actually places us in Jesus and gives us all the benefits that Jesus Christ has actually purchased for us in his life. Now again, Jesus is the one who does the work. The Spirit is the one who applies it. But water baptism is the symbol of this spiritual baptism. And it is Jesus' mark of ownership on you. It is not what saves you. Now I want you to notice that Jesus did not say, if they believe, but they're not baptized. 
that they're going to be lost. It's only if they don't believe that they would be condemned because baptism, again, is not what saves you. I'm just emphasizing that because of what we saw last Lord's Day evening. Uh, there are churches, historic churches, and even churches you know, that aren't just historic that exist today, several as a matter of fact, that believe that baptism saves you. Baptism doesn't save you. God doesn't work through baptism to save you. Uh, God works through the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith alone, not through faith plus some work, even a work that the Lord gives to us. Baptism is something we submit to as the evidence that we have been saved. We receive that mark upon us uh, because the Lord desires to put it on us and because it does represent again what has happened to us spiritually, but it's not something that saves us. So again, here's the commission. Take the gospel to all creation, not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, and declare it to them, preach it to them, bear witness of it to them, because this is what Jesus says he is going to use to save others, and this is the only thing that he uses. We need to be thankful. It's a very simple message that can very simply and easily be communicated to others. And Sometimes you might think, well, what, what can these words do? I mean, how can these words be powerful to save? And yet the Lord makes them powerful to save. We need to get that gospel out. And, of course, we need also to make sure we have received it. And we're not just believing the facts and saying, I believe Jesus lived and died. He rose again from the dead. I'm saved. And I go along living my life the way the rest of the world lives its life and, and say it's fine. No, the Bible says that there will be changes. As a matter of fact, that's what we come to secondly. Uh, when we see what it is Jesus tells us would be the signs or the evidences that would accompany those who believe. Now, I need to do something at this point that I don't often like to do, and that is bring up textual questions. You know, that, that is, what do the, the Greek manuscripts, the, the copies we have of the original autographs, uh, those witnesses to what they actually said. What do those manuscripts actually contain uh, in this particular portion of Mark? I don't like to bring up those questions because I don't want to you know, make you in any way lose confidence in the fact that what we have is the Word of God. Let me just simply say this. If you were to add up all the variations that exist in, in the manuscripts that we have of the... Um, Greek New Testament, and I think we have over 5,000 uh, of them. Uh, the variation that exists among all 5,000, I think, is half, one half of 1%. When you compare it to other works that were written long ago and have been transmitted to, to today that sometimes have as much as 30% corruption in the text, God has done a marvelous job of preserving uh, his word. And the only reason why there's any variation is because men were the ones who transmitted it, but obviously the Lord preserved it. And I should also mention this, that of this half a percent of variation of which the differences are mainly like word order, sometimes personal pronouns might be second person plural, sometimes first person plural, none of them affect any doctrine of Scripture, except perhaps for this one, which is why we need to, um, uh, to look more closely uh, at this particular section. Now, what we have here is something that's interesting. As you look at the Greek manuscripts, um, we find a variation in them of how Mark actually ends. Uh, several of the texts actually end at verse 8. And if you had your Bibles open, you would see it would end this way, which doesn't really bring it to a conclusion. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid, period. That's, that's the end of the gospel. We don't even actually, I think at this point, um, see Jesus. Oh, no, yeah, he did. No, no, he didn't appear until after this. So in that case, Mark's gospel wouldn't even contain a reference to Jesus being seen. Uh, other texts actually don't end with verse 8, but they end with that sort of parenthetical reference at the, at the end of verse 20. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. 
it, it almost sounds like somebody didn't like the way it ended and wanted to add something more to it to make it end. Now that is the most questionable part of the text here. But then there are other uh, manuscripts that contain the verses that we're looking at from verse 9 down to verse 20. Some important manuscripts don't contain it. So there's, there's a question. There's a question mark here. So I just want to um, let you know about that ahead of time so that you and I will both be careful about what we see here. Because here we have, as I've said, a couple of things that we don't see anywhere else in Scripture. And we're going to see that there are even some churches that have, have made this the basis of their faith as far as handling serpents and drinking poison. We do need to be careful with what is actually said here. Now, I wanted to um, just give you an example of this. Uh, what can happen uh, if you take this the wrong way? And by the way, even if the text says what it says and stands as it stands, it still does not um, tell us that we ought to be doing what some of these churches are doing. Now, I, I did a little search, uh, searching on the web, and I found a news article where they're actually talking about what goes on in some churches uh, in, the, in the hills, as it were, back east in Appalachia. And let me, uh, let me read just certain quotes from that, um, from that news article. It says this, Snake handlers dwell at the edge of the spiritual frontier. A community of people who are willing to die for their faith three times a week in church. Members of the Pentecostal Holiness Church take up venomous snakes to prove their faith in God. The practice <clears throat> is still widespread in Appalachia, though mostly hidden. There are an estimated 125 snake handling churches scattered across Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Appalachia, where the tradition is strongest. Snakes in church are against the law everywhere but West Virginia. <laughs> Though in most states, it's a misdemeanor offense the authorities don't bother with. Well, it sounds to me like a deadly weapon. I don't, I don't know about it. So anyway, serpent handlers draw their particular devotion from the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There are the five signs often practiced in snake handling churches, including the sipping of poison, such as strychnine, or lie as a test of faith. Coots, who is one of the pastors of these churches, has been bitten nine times by venomous snakes. Each time he refused medical attention. Half of his right middle finger is gone as a result of a fang from a yellow rattler. In 1995... A woman who was bit in his church refused to go to the hospital. She died on Coote's couch while the church members prayed over her. One, oh, Jamie Coots again, this is the pastor, he says this, taking up serpents to me, it's just showing that God has power over something that he created that does have the potential of injuring you or taking your life. And then his worship leader his name is Hamblin, says this, after the two-hour service, Hamblin explains what it feels like. The feeling to take up serpents is unexplainable, he says. It's better felt than told. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding to know that you're standing there with death in your hand and the anointment of God has protected you to let you do that. Well, again, it just shows us the danger of using this text this way. And by the way, I don't believe that even, again, as I've said, even if this text stands, I don't think it warrants this kind of behavior. What is it that Jesus is, is actually um, uh, telling us to do in this text? Or what is he actually saying here? Is he saying that this is how we would know that we're Christians? Is this how we would know whether God's word was true? Uh, I want you to, to bear in mind that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil on one occasion to go up to the pinnacle of the temple. Actually, Lucifer took him up there, and he said, if you're, if you're the Son of God, cast yourself off. 
because it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Well, what was Jesus' response to him? I'll prove to you that I am who I said I am, and he throws himself over the side. Does he say that all Christians ought to get up to the highest point they can and just jump off to prove that they're Christians? No, Jesus said, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, these are not things the Lord has given to us to test whether we're true believers or not, but it's something that if he said it at all, was meant to be a sign and a protection to his disciples if they should fall into this kind of a circumstance. As a matter of fact, we do find one example in Scripture of the Apostle Paul who was bit by a snake. He took some wood, he put it in the fire, a serpent came out of the fire and fastened onto his hand before he could do anything about it. He didn't take the viper and say, look, I'm a Christian, you know, and put it on his hand. But the Lord preserved him through it as he promised that he would. I don't think we're going to find any examples in Scripture of any of the disciples drinking poison. But we certainly do have examples of the other signs that the Lord gave to some of his disciples. On one occasion, the Lord gave the 12 the power to cast out demons, to lay hands on the sick, and to heal them, even to raise the dead. On another occasion, he gave this authority to 70 of his disciples. And we know that it wasn't until later that some of his disciples, again, not all, but um, certainly on the day of Pentecost they did, but Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30, that not all received the gift of speaking in tongues. Now, we know that those things actually did take place. We know that the Lord gave those gifts and those signs that followed. But we do need to remember the reason why he gave these gifts. And that was primarily to authenticate the message that they were bringing, that this was, in fact, his word. Because how are you going to prove that what you're bringing is actually the word of God or the word of man? Well, God actually proved it by performing miracles, by doing signs and wonders that were so uh, present and so inexplicable that people were amazed and it stopped traffic. Again, not like the miracles that we often hear about today, which you're looking to see whether it actually happened or not, and there's still some question. The kind of miracles that the Lord performed were things that they saw and they immediately knew that something had happened there was beyond their ability. They were shocked, they were startled, they were amazed, and then they listened because they knew that what they were saying came from God. And the same thing was, is true with regard to tongues in a certain sense because Paul tells us that tongues were actually given as a sign to unbelieving Jews. That was the primary reason why he gave them. We read in his first letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 14, verses 21 through 22. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. As a matter of fact, that text he quoted was specifically prophesied regarding Israel. That God was going to speak to them in the future uh, through various languages, and yet they still would not believe through the lips of foreigners. As a matter of fact, on the day of Pentecost, that's exactly what he did. When he poured out his spirit to empower his church to be witnesses, they spoke in tongues. And by the way, when those who had gathered in Jerusalem and for the Feast of Pentecost, which was one of those three feasts that all the, uh, the male Jews would have to appear before the Lord in Jerusalem. On that one occasion, when they heard the sound of the Spirit made as he was descending, they rushed to see what was going on, and they gathered around where the disciples were gathered, and they heard the disciples, who were not from their particular area, speaking in their own languages. Now, he, they didn't hear the disciples just, you know, muttering, babbling, angelic language that nobody could understand. But they heard them speaking languages that they did understand and, as a matter of fact, was meant to be a witness to them. And you know what the result of that was? First of all, they were amazed. How can these men who are all Galileans be speaking in our language? They don't even know it. How can they be speaking our dialect? 
It arrested their attention. They were amazed. And so when Peter got up and preached, 3,000 were converted in that sermon. Why? Well, because God poured out of his Holy Spirit, for one, but also because God was attesting to the fact that this was his word through the tongues that they were speaking. It was meant for unbelieving Israel. Now, it is our particular belief as a congregation, as a denomination, that the Jews were all evangelized in, in the sense that God meant them to be evangelized before 70 AD and he brought judgment on them for their crucifying the Messiah. And so since the Jews had been evangelized, the tongues were no longer necessary. Since the word of God is complete and the Lord has already testified through particular signs and miracles, um, I believe that those particular gifts, or we believe that those things have ceased as well. By the way, I should mention an historic example of, of this. Um, uh, when um, uh, Calvin, I believe it was, was challenged by the Catholic Church. Uh, we have miracles, they say. We believe God is with us. God is doing miracles among us. And it, it, it vindicates, it authenticates what we're teaching. By the way, as we compare what they're teaching with Scripture, we've seen that it isn't altogether what the Bible teaches. Uh, where are your miracles, Calvin, that prove that what you're teaching is true? And Calvin pointed to the Bible and he says the miracles are in here. God already authenticated his word and it's his word we submit to. This is what we base our doctrine on. This is what we base truth on. God has already authenticated it. He has already vindicated it. We don't need further miracles. Now, what that means is that I don't believe that today we can really tell whether we're a believer or not by these particular signs, whether I speak in tongues. There are churches that would say you're not a Christian unless you speak in tongues, or on the basis of this, they might say, unless you can take up a serpent and survive it, you know, if you get bit by it or drink poison, or unless you can cast out devils, raise the dead, or lay your hands on the sick and they'll recover, then you really can't demonstrate you're a Christian. But let me just... Um, give you one other thing that would lead us away from that, maybe two, that even when he was giving these signs, he gave them to Judas to do. Judas was able to, you know, he went out with the 12. He may have even gone out with the 70. He laid hands on the sick and they recovered. He may have even raised the dead. He cast out devils. And yet he himself was a devil. And so even even there you see the signs were not conclusive evidence that one was even a Christian because the Lord gave it to one who was not a believer because he was numbered among the apostles. Now that's not to say though that God doesn't still give evidence. God does give evidence that one is a true believer and I think it's a far more powerful testimony than what he gave then. At least our Lord believes it to be the case. And he even said it to his disciples while these things were still being done, while the gifts were still in force. He says in John 13, verse 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love is that evidence that is more powerful than these others. By the way, I think it's also interesting that when the Apostle John wrote his first letter to a group of people who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to show them that they really were saved, you know, to convince them, to give them assurance, he didn't point to any of these signs that were on this list in, in Mark 16, but rather he points to that one that Jesus gave in John 13, verse 35. He pointed to love. If I could summarize the letter of, of John, the first letter, it basically is this, that if you love God, if you love his son, if you love his people, if you love his truth, if you love his commandments, that is the evidence that you are a true believer. I mean, if you want to know that you're a true believer, you have to have these things. You have to love all these things. And the one thing that all these things have in common is basically holiness. All of these things reflect the holiness of God. Certainly God is holy. His Son is holy. His Word is holy. His commandments are holy. His people are holy. And if you can love all these things for their holiness, that is the evidence that you are a believer. 
by the way, if you do love these things for their holiness, then you will be transformed by that love. You will be becoming more like the Father, more like the Son. You will be growing into the image of Jesus Christ. If you are growing into that image, which you can only do if the Spirit of God is working that love in you, then you are a true believer. You don't look to these particular signs, but you look to that love. Now let me uh, conclude by saying that there is one other sign that the Lord gives us in this text to show that we are true believers, and it is related to the one we've just seen, and that is that you're willing to reach out to others with the gospel, that your love for the Lord and your love for your neighbor is strong enough to move you to do something for the good of their souls, to evangelize. I mean, if we kind of step back from the scriptures for a moment and we look at the scriptures as a whole, uh, basically man fell into sin at the very beginning. God gave the remedy, the promise he was going to send a savior. That's what the whole Testament is about, pointing to the Savior. And then the Savior comes, and what does Jesus do when he comes into the world? He preaches repentance and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus came into the world to proclaim the gospel, but of course he also came that there might be a gospel. When his work was done on the earth, what did he command his disciples to do? but to continue that work of preaching the gospel. And then Jesus ascended into heaven at the right hand of God that he might rule and overrule everything to help them in this work. And then we read in verse 20, they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. Jesus came into the world to preach the gospel. He handed that obligation off to his disciples to preach the gospel and that work still is ongoing and it falls on our shoulders because we are his disciples who live in the present time. Uh, it is our responsibility now to get this gospel out uh, to others. Now I do believe that uh, the primary question that we can wrap both of these things up, both of these points up into this morning is basically this, and I think it's the question that our Lord is asking each one of us. Do you love God? And do you love your neighbor enough to bring the gospel to them that they might find forgiveness and life and that Jesus might be glorified? Now, the only way that anyone around us is going to be saved, I think we understand this quite, quite clearly, is if we bring the gospel to them. That's the only way. We are the ones who have it, and so we are the ones who need to do it. Now, the only way we're going to do it is if we love the Lord strongly enough and if we love our neighbor strongly enough to overcome anything that might be making us unwilling to do it. Again, the, the idea of the things that might happen. Somebody might get angry at me, might not want to be my friend anymore, might not want to hang around me, uh, might turn other people against me. Uh, those things happen. But those, th those things, you know, again, is what we have to expect is going to happen in the world. We can't let it stop us. If we don't share with them, they're not going to be saved. If we don't share with them, they're going to go to hell. If we don't share with them... We're not doing what the Lord calls us to do. And again, realize uh, the Lord is not necessarily calling us to do this full time. And I'm not saying that you, you have to share with absolutely everybody that you see at every moment so you don't get your work done, you know, that you, you can't do other things. But we all understand that the Lord does bring into our lives people and opportunities, friends, neighbors, people we work with, family members, immediate family, more extended family members, we all have a, you know, a field for evangelism, a field for mission work. And we may be the only witnesses that these people actually have. Uh, we've got the message. We know it saves. We know that God makes it powerful to save. It saved us. We know it could save them. The Lord tells us to take the message to them that they might be saved, that they might repent and turn to him. We have to overcome this unwillingness 
to reach out to others. So basically, this love that I've been talking about here is the evidence that we are true believers, that the Holy Spirit actually lives in us. He's performing his saving work in our souls, but it's also what we have to have in us if we are to reach others with the gospel because otherwise we're never going to be able to overcome our unwillingness to do it for all the reasons already listed. So if you are the Lord's this morning and you have the love of God in your hearts, then cultivate that love. Uh, work with the Lord. You know, sanctification, which is what the Lord says will be the evidence that will follow our justification. The fact that we've truly trusted in Jesus, we will begin to be transformed into his image. But that sanctification, that, that work of the Holy Spirit is that by which he transforms us into the image of Jesus. He is working in us to make us more like Jesus. What was Jesus like? Jesus evangelized. Uh, Jesus lived a life in every part that was one continual act of sacrifice, of love and devotion and worship to his Father. And as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that we need to do the same thing. We need to offer ourselves up as living sacrifices to God. Uh, we need to give our whole lives to him in a continual act of love, worship, and devotion, among which we need to do what Jesus would do in caring for the lost, and that is reaching out to them with the gospel that they might be saved. So again, we all know, I think, by this time how we cultivate that work of the Spirit in our hearts. We do need to use the means God has given to us to build up His presence in us, to be filled with the Spirit so we can overcome the obstacles, so we can actually reach out and that others might be saved. So may the Lord help us to do this. May He give us the grace that, as it were, the, the, the push through really the whole Bible. This is what Everything that the Lord has come to do is about. Sometimes we think it just sort of ends in our salvation. God has saved me. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm safe. That's what it's all about. And um, I'm, I'm content with that. But we need to realize that God saved us for more than just our personal safety. He also saved us and left us here that we might be his witnesses, his lights in the world. May the Lord give us grace to see that. May he give us grace to own that responsibility. May he give us the grace actually to, to reach out with the gospel. And may he also give grace to those who hear it from us that they might be saved. Well, may the Lord take his word and apply it to us this morning. Let's bow for just a moment of prayer and let's ask that he might uh, do that.